Welcome to the June 5th edition of the PFF Forecast. It is uh, George and Eric. We are in different places, but we are in the same state of mind, which is one of loving football. Eric told me before the podcast that he has like one rant, and then all of a sudden within five minutes, he has two or three rants. So this is going to be a special podcast. We're also going to tier the defenses in the NFL, which means you are in for an absolute treat. This is going to be a fun pod. Let's rock. I don't know which rant you want to start with, but I, full disclosure, I have no idea what this is going to be about. I was told I have a rant, I have a receiver I'm excited about, and I've just been loving football recently. So uh, I don't, I don't really know where to start. I'm going to sit back, relax, and enjoy this ride. Well, I, I, look, I, I think um, the syndicate has been uh, privy to like a great deal of um, of goodness lately. But I think a lot of it has been uh, maybe a little bit mean-spirited in, in, in nature, especially my Arthur Smith rants. You could say that, yeah. This one is going to be less mean-spirited and more just like a, I think, a teachable moment. Our friend and friend of the show, Mina Kimes, tweeted out, um, little thing I noticed while preparing for next week's pod Amongst defensive backs with 25 or more targets against, here were the following. Here's where the following players rank in catch rate below expectation. Uh, slot cornerback Teron Johnson, safety Jordan Poyer, and Tredav- Poyer, I know. Tredavious White, I just like saying Poyer. Uh, Poyer's mm-hmm. thirds, uh, White seven. The Bills dot, 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 and then three like emojis. Um so I responded and it didn't actually get the, I, I, there was, it was pretty actually dismissed, but I said, I think some of this is the fact that the metric is not opponent adjusted. Um, you know, when you think about mm-hmm. over expectation sort of measurements, especially on the defensive side of the ball, you have to understand that defenses, they do to a certain extent, they do to a certain extent, like, um, they do alter the expectation for sure, but not nearly as much as the offense does. And, and, and even like there, there's actually like a fair amount of, uh, of, you know, there's a big chance that that number could be noise for the wrong reason. So it, it, you know, we always talk about Mahomes and how he doesn't do really well in CPOE. And that's in large part because he engineers throws where the expectation of completion is higher. So then when he does complete the ball, those small little, one minus the completion probability is actually smaller than it should be because there are, um, you know, there are aspects of his play that make his passes easier where maybe a player who rates well in that metric, who's not as good of a player like Kirk Cousins or Ryan Tannehill, they're not engineering easy throws for themselves, but the ones that they do complete, um, A, the metric is giving them the, the, the credit and B, that difference is bigger. Mm-hmm. So, if you rate highly and, and and there's also a red flag that I have almost always when like three defensive backs on the same team are in the top 10, I get 2018 bears mm-hmm. alarms going off yeah. in my head. Right. When we were building metrics and it was like, Oh my God, look at uh, Bryce Callahan and look at uh, who's the safety Eddie Jackson and, and so on. And then you get all of them in the same one. I almost immediately turn to the fact that like, okay, this is a team level thing that and almost a lot of team level things on defense are the product of who you play. Yes. And well, go ahead. I was going to say uh, the, the when you read that stat, right? You read those players out. You know what immediately came into my mind? The Bills played Tua and the Dolphins twice. I don't know if they actually faced Tua twice, but regardless, they faced the Patriots, who now Mac Jones was good, but those receivers aren't separating from anybody. And they played Zach Wilson and the Jets twice. That's a recipe for the yes. expectation not being quite low enough <laughs> on the offensive side of the ball. Yeah, it's actually even uh, – uh, and, again, like I'm going to come back with this and say the Bills' defense is 
is in the elite tier to the extent that you can be elite. Mm-hmm. But but I'm I'm what I want what I want to say is like that kind of if and they were like oh and five in one score games or something last year maybe oh and six I can't remember exactly what uh, the stat was so there's some regression on the positive end but I think vis a vis their defense you know it, it like think about this for a second. When Zach Wilson makes a, a throw, let's say you find all the parameters of this throw. So 25 yards downfield to X, Y coordinates in this many seconds with this separation. Zach Wilson as a rookie, that expectation is lower than league average. So if you break up that pass, then your that itty bitty uh, completion rate under expected should be smaller in absolute mm-hmm. value. Right, because if it's Tom Brady and you're breaking the ball up, then that expected completion percentage is higher. So when it, when the completion probability is zero or the actual completion is zero, then that difference is bigger. Mm-hmm. And, and so again, you know, she she turned and, and and this is you know the tools that she has, and she said you know the Bills' pass defense was number one in DVOA. Now you know I'm not going to you know I, I like Aaron and I Aaron chats at Football Outsiders. I'm not the biggest fan of DVOA, but it's not. Like it's fine. It's directionally fine. I, I would assume, um, but but I but then I asked. I said I, I asked politely. I was like, okay, well, um, do you do you factor in weather? And and he he quickly went to the you know the Mac Jones game where he threw three times. He said, well, that's not actually going to um, elicit any change because they only threw three times and it's a rate stat. Um, and then, but I looked at the average and median wind speed of a game in Buffalo, and it's the highest for all home games, right? So mm-hmm. Buffalo got mm-hmm. to play nine home games by virtue of being in the AFC. They got to play them, as you said, against really easy opponents. They got Mike White and, and Zach Wilson. That's they right, got, Mike White. They got two, uh, and Mike White actually had the third highest yards gained against them in a game. They only gave up three, two 300-yard passing games. But, like, Ryan Tannehill was, like, the third-best quarterback they faced last year. Um and, you know, and they had Mike White. They had the game where they, they knocked Tua out early, and so it was Jacoby Brissett for half the game. Then they got Tua. Um, they got Matt Ryan in, in, like, a windy snow game. But but wind speed is what affects it the most. And mm-hmm. they, you know, Buffalo's home games have the highest wind speed of any team in football. That's really interesting. That's, that, that's going to matter the most, or at least it was last year. Um, and, and Aaron came back and said, well, you know, DVOA uh, in their home games is this. And it was a number that was like twice as big as what he claimed the home field advantage normally is. But then he said it wasn't that big of a home field advantage. I'm like, I, I, don't, I don't, that doesn't really square with me. You can follow the thread on Twitter. It, it's there. Um, all of this is to say that, and, and we have to make content. It's the middle, it's early June. So whatever, I, I get what Mina's doing. But I, I, I do want to, I do want to say that sometimes, and we're going to talk about defense today. I want to say that sometimes we overstate the, the we overstate the results of a defense and what they mean for the next year. And I think this is a classic case of like Buffalo was amazing defensively last year, but like even when they got the ultimate test against Kansas City, they couldn't stop the nosebleed in that game. And maybe that's because their defense wasn't one of these truly elite defenses mm-hmm. that that you know the O2 Bucks, the '85 Bears, the 2000 Raiders, the the uh, the 2022 Georgia Bulldogs. The twenty, the two thousand fifteen Denver Broncos, right? Like Cam Newton yeah. was the MVP of the league, and they completely neutralized yeah. Legi- the, the Legion game. of Boom Seahawks. Um, yeah, and even the Legion of Boom Seahawks in twenty fourteen. Uh, you know, and, and I don't mean to give Mina more, uh, you know, PTSD here, but like Tom Brady came back on them from ten down in the fourth quarter. <laughs> you know, but you know, defense yeah. is not de- when, and we've always said this that like, we don't mean defense doesn't matter, but like when offense executes, defense just matters a whole lot less than we all think, and. It, it's it's and I think that there are you know when you look at things like DVOA you look at things like that like Buffalo can be still number one but I think the gap is so much smaller than what it's made out to be like mm-hmm. they gave up yards per play it was something like half a yard less than everybody else last year and I'm going to attribute that magnitude as uh, 0.4 yards less than Cleveland I'm going to attribute that magnitude to to the the eight the things that aided them like weather and their fact that their opponents were were really really easy. Yeah, it's interesting because we we talk about this a lot, and, and you know, look, people when we say defense doesn't matter, <laughs> we've grown up grown up a little bit from that. The point was really to illustrate that, to your point, when when an offense is operating on all cylinders, 
the defense is just a little bit <laughs> a little bit powerless you know there's only so much that you can do and actually this went into how i tiered the defenses if you're a defense the only you'd have to have no weaknesses for you to be a great defense and for an offense you don't that that doesn't need to be the case i think that's one of the things that helps contextualize what we mean is maybe not it, it maybe shouldn't be you know oh it, it doesn't matter as much or all these different things but that what you need to be as a defense to be truly elite is so much more than what you need as an offense you need every player on the defense to to be especially in coverage to be really really sound oh and by the way you also need a great defensive coordinator like Think about the Bucs against the Rams, right? It's like, and I'm not saying Todd Bowles isn't a great defensive coordinator. He made one bad play call. <laughs> not but one, yeah, he made it. a couple. But like, he made a really bad play call against a guy that was destroying the blitz in Matthew Stafford and it cost them a, a chance to go to the Super Bowl. Like, though, there's so many things. You basically have to be perfect on defense to be a truly great defense. And, you know, even then, to your point, like if an offense is just humming on all cylinders, it's it's going to matter less in the grand scheme of things. But I think it's a really good point. And it will, it, what you said there is going to show up in how I tiered the defenses. Um, now, I don't know if you want to get to your other points. By the way, we I'll, should I'll say I'll talk that, about the last one at the end. I, okay. I've been kind of like trying to have one thing a week where I'll just like tweet it out and then I'll get like 10 radio requests mm -hmm. and like the sermon on the Mount last yeah. year. It was last week. It was David Carr or Derek Carr. And then the week before it was Jalen hurts. Uh, I found, I like, I mean, I'm just a so, big fan. So do you have one this week or are you going to let the syndicate know? I will let the syndicate know first and then I'm tweeting okay. it out Monday. Um, what are we, what are we going to call this? Like, cause I'm a big theme fan of, of this. Theme of the week is what Dave has been calling it. Dave. Is yeah. Just that's, like and I love Dave. That's a really, we need, we need a better title. You know, it's like, um, think of me as the, the Salton executive. Speaks. What? The Salton Speaks. The, this, the Sultan's Sermon? The Sultan's Sermon? I don't know. Sultan's Sultan <laughs> Speaks? Yeah, we'll, we'll workshop we'll it. We'll workshop Anyways. that, yeah. Um, before we get to our tears for this week, and I don't know if we're going to cry here, but we'll find out in a second. Um, a reminder that the fantasy football is already upon us especially when you're playing best ball fantasy and underdog fantasy. Um, in case you're new to this, best ball is the easiest way to play fantasy football because you draft a team and that's it. You don't have to worry about waivers. You don't have to worry about these start-sit decisions. I, I, I don't know how people aren't more into best ball after the agony of waking up on a Sunday, just wanting to enjoy your day, but then spending like three hours trying to decide who to start and who to sit and then invariably making the wrong decision, hating your life and being pissed off. For the next eight hours, don't do that. Play best ball fantasy football and go do so at Underdog Fantasy, which is the best place to play it. Here's the deal. They have best ball mania, $10 million in total cash prizes. The winner last year drafted in June. So the time is now. And if you use promo code PFF when you sign up, your first deposit will be doubled up to $100. And if you use PFF when you play at least 10 of those dollars, you will get a free PFF subscription. Again, I have no idea how this is still going on, but this is your opportunity to go cash in early in the summer while everyone else is asleep. Go to underdogfantasy.com or download the app or wherever you get your apps. Use promo code PFF when you sign up and when you play, and you will not be disappointed. All right. Um, By the way, speaking of not being disappointed, this, my offshore book, Letting Me Live Bet USFL, is just, I mean, manna from heaven right now. Did you, can the, you the show, Philadelphia can you show the Stars, people, the, the, show the people your, uh, your shirt here? Yeah, the Philadelphia Stars, the two-time champion of the old <laughs> USFL. My friend Seren Petro is a huge fan, um, okay. and he asked me which team I was going to be a fan of in this league, and I said, whoever covers. Um, and, that was why uh, you're a fan of the Lions. Thank you. Yep. Uh, we'll mm -hmm. talk about that. We'll talk about that at the end of the show. Um, and Philadelphia is about to, if they win today, they're going to make the playoffs. But the thing that they do is they don't play a lick of defense and they can score. So like overs, so like overs in this league have been kind of tenuous. The Kyle Slaughter game yesterday ended 10, nine, right? There've been weeks where, you know, the quarterback play isn't sorry. great, but like these games, the Michigan game, the, sorry, the Michigan with Pax and Lynch right here and the Case Cook is Philadelphia Stars. Like, they just don't play a lick of defense, which 
Like it's just a live over fest. Uh, and so last week I won a ton on like live overs with them. And I was just like, all right, I'm buying, I'm, I'm taking some of this, these winnings, buying a Philadelphia star shirt uh, to wear on the show. Uh, Jeff Fisher, uh, you know, Fade Fisher is, is a, is, is a good application, not only in the USFL, but also in the WNBA with Derek Fisher, your Los Angeles Sparks. Poor Derek Fisher. Okay, let's get into the tiering of defenses. I'm going to uh, go first for the first tier because in doing so, I'm going to let you go first. My tier one is uh, defined as such. A defense that makes me worried even when they face a truly great offense. And this tier is empty for me. Um, I love it. There is no tier one defense. I think that we need to have perspective, as you said, you know, across kind of the, the different years um, and, and sort of understand where we're at. But here's, here's the point is there isn't a defense that when they're playing a great offense that isn't injured is worrying me. That just isn't, you know, if there's inclement weather to your point um, earlier, that could obviously change things. If there's an injury that could change things, but all things being equal, um, I just don't think there is one. So, uh, I think that should make, I mean, it makes me excited about this upcoming season. It's made me excited about a lot of upcoming seasons. I do think there are some very good defenses, but I do not think there is one that um, actually makes me worried if they're facing a great offense that is not injured. Yeah, I like that. I, I think, right. I, I, I think the defense's job is to not get beat by shitty quarterbacks, right? Agreed. You know, so and I, to take advantage. Take advantage when there is... You know, when the offense makes a mistake, when there is an injury, yeah. right? Yeah. Making sure that you're not blowing coverages and, and all those things. Like, there is certainly opportunity there, um, but it's it, it's just you need that proper perspective, I think. Yeah. Okay, so here are my tier. My first tier is they were elite in 2021 and have a decent chance to be so in 2023. Okay. So this is – you can clearly see my, like, statistician, you know – uh, defense doesn't matter mm. that much, like, you know, thread here. But I, I have them Buffalo, New Orleans, Cleveland, New England, Tampa Bay, and Los Angeles. Rams. Okay. So um, the ones that I, I think New Orleans will be pretty good, um, especially I, I don't think their schedule is terribly hard. Um, Buffalo's schedule is going to be harder, as I detailed in the mm. tweets there. They play about three times as many uh, elite quarterbacks this year. Um, but they get Travis White back. They get Kiki or Elam in the mix. I think Cleveland's going to be pretty good. They get uh, Cleveland, you know, they get uh, Clowney back. Um, already some good defenders are Garrett uh, Ward. New England, they lose J.C. Jackson, but I actually think that J.C. Jackson meant less to that defense than people want to believe. And then Tampa Bay getting Akeem Hicks is like a really like low-key yeah. great signing for them. Um and Logan Hall is going to be good for that team. They're their uh, first pick in the draft. And then the Rams, it's 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 hard for them to be bad. I think Raheem Morris is really sm- is a really smart defensive play caller. Ramsey's a really good chess piece. And so there there's six of them there that I say, you know, have a chance to be elite. Uh, okay. And the chance is based upon how they performed last year. Um, I so tier two for me is a defense that makes a big difference against any team with some kind of weakness right you know and so this could be a really great offense that has you know an injured player if you're an average team you feel you know good about having this defense go against them um and i have all the ones that you have with a couple of additions so um i i I have the uh bill saints rams bucks who else did you have have the browns in there Mm -hmm. yep have the browns as well um here are the other teams that i've included I have the Ravens, the Chargers, and the Packers. And so the Ravens, most injured team by a mile last year. Now, that wasn't all defense, but a lot of it was defense. They were, um, they had zero wins without when, uh, since Marlon Humphrey got injured. Very complete defense. And I, I love the way, you know, they obviously added a couple of players. This year, including Kyle Hamilton, who everyone loved as a as a draft pick that was at thirteen. Um, now they they have, you know, Owe and Bowser on the outside. You have Clayus Campbell and Michael Pierce on the interior. 
You have uh, Peters and Humphrey on the outside. Um, they're, they're, oh, they have a little bit of a weakness at linebacker. Patrick Queen has not been particularly great there. But um, they're an incredibly well-rounded defense with a, with a really good defensive backfield. The Packers, I mean, the Packers were good last year, and they get Jair Alexander back. So, yeah. um, you know, I, I think that defense, I mean, there, there's a really good chance that the Packers have the best defense in the NFL this year. I think it's a, a very good chance. And, um, I mean, yeah. they might need it, but um, that that's one. And then the Chargers... The Chargers were tough for me because it was like we haven't seen it yet. But if you look at just the talent on one defense, there isn't a defense with more talent than the Los Angeles Chargers. <laughs> like that's yeah. just a fact. And yeah. um, and I don't I don't know that it's particularly close. So if they can put it together, it's amazing. I think the one that might be close is the Bills. And what was really interesting is, I mean, obviously the Bills added Von Miller. That's amazing. And I could very much see a situation where Von Miller does for the Bills kind of what he did for the for the Rams. Like, the Rams were really good last year. The Rams, when they added Von Miller and Von Miller all of a sudden had a 90 PFF grade, like, you were just petrified of that defensive line. And I could see that really being the case with Oliver and Rousseau, who have already been playing well. And then you have a great defensive backfield with White, the two safeties, and Hyde and, and Poyer. And, um, you know, that could be a really terrifying defense. To your point, they were actually first in the NFL in EPA uh, allowed. And number two, I believe, were the Patriots, who I actually don't have on this, this list. No, sorry, it was the Saints and then the Patriots. But you think about, you know, those inclement weather conditions, obviously Buffalo um uh there and they didn't have Tredavious White for a lot of the year. So um I think they get a little boost because of the the weather certainly. Yeah, that's a great group. I, I think a couple things. So the, you have a bunch of teams that are in my not elite in 2021, but a decent chance to do so in 2022. Mm -hmm. And that's Green Bay, Philadelphia, Los Angeles Chargers, and Baltimore Ravens. Uh Wink Martindale is gone. Um I think he went to the New York Giants. Uh they get Mike McDonald, who is their linebacker coach and then went and coached uh, the Michigan Wolverines to the college football playoff. He comes back as the defensive, as the defensive coordinator, which I think is extremely exciting um, uh, for them. Uh, Green Bay, I, I agree with you. I think Green Bay has more talent than anybody. Um, Adrian Amos uh, is the best safety in the NFL possibly. Um, mm -hmm. And that no one knows about Philadelphia has Slay and Bradbury. Um, they also, uh, got uh, Jordan Davis to sort of play that. Like, they were very unimaginative defensively last year under Jonathan Gannon, and it was like, I think it was just because they didn't have talent that they weren't, like, disguising coverages and doing stuff like that. They can do that now. And obviously the Chargers, I think, you know, have the goods now. Sebastian Joseph Day, um, you know, Kyle Van Noy, Khalil Mack. Like, they got guys who are just tough guys now, too. Like, where, like, Khalil Mack's a really good pass rusher, obviously, but he's also a menace, like setting the edge and stuff. And like that, I think as you get older, as a defensive lineman, that's a value you can add that when we start saying, okay, the age curve isn't quite that good for him as a pass rusher, he can still add something to the Chargers were missing last year. I like that group. My tier, next tier, so uh, to recap, again, tier one for me, empty. Tier two, basically all the teams that, in my opinion, don't have you know, they don't have a, a weakness. And if they do, it's a minor one. It's not like they have a atrocious coverage unit or a, a worthless pass rush or whatever. Tier three for me is defined as such. They have, they have the potential to be in that tier after this year, but it would take a couple of things going right for them. You know, they don't, they don't quite have the solidness that those others have. But they have some component of their defense that is, and this is kind of the, the key criteria here, they have some component of their defense that you go, oh man, that's a special group. So this is where the Patriots show up for me. And I have in parentheses only because of Bill Belichick. So if you look at, and by the way, you can get this on pff.com. Um, if you just look at their lineup and you look at the PFF grades there, they're isn't a ton where you go, oh man, that's a huge difference maker. Obviously, you've got McCordy in the back. Um, you know, 
Matthew Judon was amazing last year, but from a PFF grade perspective, you know, leaves some things to be desired. Was really good as a pass rusher. I do think a little bit of that will come back to to earth a, a tad. You certainly have, you know, you have some things that you say, okay, maybe they can pull these things together. But at the same time, I have, I, you know, you just have to have some questions from a talent perspective. But Bill Belichick is so incredible that I'm going to put them in this in this tier. And if some of those players that he has put his faith in figure it out, then then they could certainly be a, a tier, you know, the top tier uh, with teams in it by the end of the year. And the Cowboys, the Dolphins, the Broncos, the 49ers, the Commanders, and the Steelers. Um, I think all of these teams have some really, really great areas of their defense and then just have some questions. For the Cowboys, you know, obviously Micah Parsons was amazing last year. I do think they have some questions in in the secondary. Trayvon Diggs, as great as he was intercepting the football, also was the most targeted player in the NFL last year. And when he didn't intercept the ball, there's a good chance that he was going for a big play. The Broncos, interestingly, I think could have um, you know, one of the more well-rounded defenses, but they're losing Vic Pangio, so it'll be interesting to see how they look. The 49ers, it, the 49ers are there with the Chargers, and I, I, you know, I think the Chargers and the Bills with the best defensive line. I think you could maybe put the Steelers in there too, but I'm not quite as bullish on them. Steelers the just show. lost Stephon to it, right? Exactly, so that's, that's exactly. But I think the 49ers could should potentially be the favorite for the best defensive line in the NFL. Um, especially if Drake Jackson shows up. Um, commanders are, are right there as well and have a, a decent secondary. Um, I think the Niners question mark is in the secondary. And then the Steelers, you know, obviously TJ Watt is fantastic. Um, I think they're a really well-rounded defense. Um, and, you know, for that reason, make it in this group. Very good. I have a group now that's called elite in 2021, but mm. will have a hard time repeating in 2022. Carolina, which like weirdly had good defensive metrics last year, mm-hmm. you know, they lose Gilmore. Uh, I don't know if they go into the season with Brian Burns because if I'm that team, I'm selling him because he's really good. And, and you get a like Kansas City should be calling the Carolina Panthers and trading for Brian Burns. Um, Las Vegas, weird that you said the Chiefs there. That's yeah, I, I, strange. Las Vegas, um, I actually I can't wait for this to come out. Uh, our interns, uh, hopefully. Uh, you know, Arjun, Haley, and uh, Judah have been working on our all coverage data, which is basically Excellent. like less um, results based and more like literally charting every single player in the coverage process. And they've been coming up with something called perfectly covered plays, which is essentially a play where no player in coverage messes up. That's and cool. the, the Vegas Raiders had like the worst rate of the, or one of the worst rates, not not the worst last year, but. It was made up for because Max Crosby was amazing, right? Mm-hmm. And, uh, you know, you had guys like Carl Nassib and and so on and so forth that were rushing the passer. They do get Chandler Jones this year, and he's been a good – but Chandler Jones is more of a – like Chandler Jones' pressure to sack conversion is kind of Jared Allen-like where mm-hmm. he doesn't have great pressure rates, but he has great sack rates. And I don't know if he's going to have the kind of impact that people believe. Um, so I think they regress a little. I think Denver does know Von Miller. Um you know, they, they lose a little depth in the secondary as well. I know Sertan was great as a rookie, but, like, we also know the consistency in the secondary is not mm-hmm. uh, a hallmark of that position. Um, you know, they get Randy Gregory, but that's always a question mark there. Miami, Dallas, and then San Francisco. I, I think San Francisco, Traverius Ward is, you know, he graded well for the Chiefs at, last year, but he can be had, as we saw with the J- Jamar Chase game. Um, D Ford is, you know, their starting edge player right now. And like that, that's been like a million dollars of pressure so far that contract Armstead's wonderful. Bose is wonderful, but like Javon Kinlaw hasn't been great yet so far. Warner's strung together a few great years of linebacker, but like the question is, is how long can he continue that? Uh, so I'm a, I'm, I'm you selling the Niners. To, you, you having questions about the Niners defense and including Warner in that is ridiculous. Okay. <laughs> there are I mean, plenty of questions. I will grant you there are plenty of questions about the Niners defense. Fred Warner is not. But but, but my issue is again is is what we talked about with the Mina t- tweet the other day. Can Fred Warner be as brilliant? Like we've seen it. Like, I'm Bobby not asking. Was, I'm not asking him to be the reason the defense is is the is but great. He is, I'm just though, saying that's the that like that defense requires him to cover so much space. And I'm not saying that 
I'm not saying that he's going to like be terrible, but like we've seen this before, like Eric Kendricks with the Vikings, like went from linebacker, like a top five linebacker in the league. And then last year he just lost it. And, you know, we, the, that position, I mean, one of the reasons we are doing all the NGS stuff with linebackers is like, we're just, the position is so volatile, right? And, and we want to be able to evaluate it better because from what I can tell results-based metrics, you know, and even like process-based metrics that we're using uh, for the linebacker position, like if I have a defense and I said, the reason this defense is good, and this is not necessarily true about the nine, but it's one of like Fred Warner's a top two reason this defense is amazing. If that player is a linebacker, I'm always going to like bail a little bit quicker on a defense than if it's like this safety or this defensive lineman, which Bosa is probably reason number one. This defense is yes. amazing. But um, can but I just real quick say Eric Kendricks is a f- six foot 30 year old player. Fred Warner is 6'3", 25 years old. Like, sure. I don't know that's the perfect comparison there. I, I'm willing to make you I – don't, I don't want to steal any more steak dinners from you, but I'm willing to bet that Fred Warner is just fine this year. Okay. <laughs> as, as, I mean, the dude was injured and was still amazing against the Packers. Like, there's something to be said for the fact that he's still a young player, I think. Anyways, people don't like it when I, bat, when I talk about the Niners, so I'll stop. Um the one in that group, so you have the, the Cowboys a little bit lower than I do. You have the Broncos um, a little bit lower than I do. Um, and I think that is that general, I mean, the Dolphins, I guess, as well. The Dolphins are interesting to me because I look at the Dolphins and the biggest concern that I have is, well, they're losing Brian Flores, who I think we can all agree was a fantastic coach and defensive right. mind. That's the biggest worry for me. But I look across this defense, and I actually think there's a lot of things that, you know, Javon Javon Holland doesn't get talked enough about. Javon Holland may have been, like, the best draft pick considering position last year. One Guy of the was most amazing. valuable players in that class. Yeah. yeah, I mean, as a 90, basically 90 PFF coverage grade last year, playing safety on the back end for the for the Dolphins was amazing. You obviously have um, Byron Jones and Xavier Howard. That's easily um, one of the best uh, cornerback duos in the league. And then you have Manuel Agba and Melvin Ingram, along with Christian Wilkins. Christian Wilkins, sixth in PFF grade among, amongst defensive tackles last year. Third in war among interior players behind Cameron Hayward and, and Aaron Donald. Um, so like, there's, yeah. a lot, there's a lot to like there. I think the question for me is obviously they're, they're now going to be in a different defensive scheme. So how does that look? And, and I think elite, their eliteness in the past is, has really hinged upon the play of the corners and the safeties. And we all know like just how, how variable that can be from mm-hmm. one year to the next. And again, like that's kind of where I'm, 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 I'm lowering and and I also like and I like you know I like Agba and I like Ingram both of them played both of them have you know been around the league and like have played well Ingram's older uh there's a reason he always only signed for like four to six million I think Agba ha- had a great year last year uh Wilkins is a guy that I, I really wanted uh you know I, Wilkins is a great football player and you know I, if, if the Chiefs it's would have included funny. him in the Tyree kill trade I would not have been bad um but but yeah, I mean, it, it, but it's 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 also just like a you know a regression thing with the new with the new coach. Okay, my tier four. The way that I define these, I kind of got um, uh, thought about this sort of from a you're the uh, opposing offense or you're playing you know a de- one of these defenses with uh, someone in fantasy or something like that. These are defenses I'm not scared of, but also not like particularly stoked to be playing. You know, this is kind of a Okay, I'm not sure that you know there's anything to, to kind of read into unless there's a glaring mismatch. And this was Panthers, Bengals, Eagles, Colts, Chiefs, Raiders, Titans. <laughs> good defenses, like all good defenses. But um, you know, you kind of like you see this defense on the other side, and you're like, okay, this should be a good game. <laughs> you know, it's not like yeah. oh, we're gonna light this team up. You know, like um, they're not gonna get a lot of interceptions or sacks. They're not gonna, you know, you're like you said, you're not starting, you're not putting them in your DFS lineup. Right. Um, I think the to highlight a couple here that I think are really interesting. Um, the the Raiders to me are really interesting because, you know, to your point about Chandler Jones, what I would say is 
I would actually look at it maybe from the other side, uh, the other uh, angle and be like, okay, Max Crosby was amazing last year. If Chandler Jones isn't being focused on, um, like he, I, I don't know, I could see them having a really good year as, as a duo. Um, and it, with the Raiders, I thought about putting the Raiders in, in a lower tier. Um, but that duo up front, I think, will be very good. Um, Trayvon Merrig on the back end has played well. Um, so, you know, I think it could be a decent year for the, for the Raiders defense as opposed to being, you know, they were, they were certainly a complete, uh, disaster in, in previous seasons. Um, I'm actually, they lose, they lose Casey Hayward, which was a yeah, pretty which big hurts. addition for them last year. I, yeah. I have like a tier that's very similar to yours. I call it fine. Okay. Like this defense is not going to make or break the plans for this team in either direction and i'm going with and there's a couple surprises here kansas city cincinnati tennessee pittsburgh new york giants seattle seahawks and indianapolis colts the one that stands out here is seattle who i who actually defense wasn't that bad last year Mm -hmm. um this defense is not elevating this team for more than a couple wins a year um but you know, when we come up for air in the middle of the season, they don't have any wins. We're going to be talking about Drew Locke and not, and not like, oh my God, they can't cover anybody, you know? Hmm. And I think Indianapolis, like Pittsburgh's the same thing. If, if Kenny Pickett or Mitch Trubisky play extremely well, I think Pittsburgh's defense is going to be good enough for them to win. Um, if not, if Matt Ryan plays good football, um, Indianapolis's defense is going to be more than like, we didn't look at last year's Indianapolis collapse and be like, well, they didn't really stop Trevor Lawrence in that game. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. You know, we, we said, oh, my God, Carson Wentz melted down. That's what Indianapolis' defense is like. Even without Eberflus, I think that they're talented enough to be fine. I think that's uh, that's accurate. We have a couple of disagreements there, by the way, but I'll save I'll save those for when I get to them. Um, I have a weird in the middle um, between Tier 4 and Tier 6, which is Tier 5. And what I have here is, like, a whole lot of variance. You know, things could go right for these defenses and they could be maybe tier three. Things could go wrong for these defenses and you could be like, my God, please bring this defense to me so that my offense can get right. And this is the Vikings, the Giants, and the Falcons. So from the Vikings perspective, they have they have a decent amount of talent on this defense in terms of players that you know, especially with with um, with uh, Hunter there, I like Cine, who they drafted um, as a safety. You've got Harrison Smith. You know, to your point, Kendricks did not play super well last year, but we've seen you know good play from him in the past. Some good players on the defensive interior. Um, you know, I I hesitate putting them in the the last tier just because they have some good players uh, on their defense and. I don't know. I wanted to give them a little bit of, of credit there. I don't think they've been, you know, a, a complete disaster. The Giants obviously have invested in the, the defense, um, you know, pretty decently, but they're, you know, I, I still have some questions, you know. So if you look at the Giants' depth chart and you go, okay, well, they don't have, um, you know, the greatest linebackers. Are they going to get? Is Kayvon Thibodeau going to be awesome? But this was the the Giants to me were a team that I could easily see making a making a jump here, and then the Falcons were interesting. The reason that I put the Falcons in here, honestly, was a it was a kind of a hat tip to AJ Terrell, who was just was yeah. the second highest graded um, corner in the NFL last year. But they also picked up Casey Hayward Jr. Grady Jarrett is very good. They draft Ebikite. I, I really like those players. Um, and so if, if all those players kind of show out, I think they could be, you know, not a complete train wreck. Yeah. Okay. Um, I'm going to, I'm going to skip to my bad in 2021 and likely bad again, because I think it can, it completes with, it, it mm-hmm. intersects with your last group a little bit. Um, and I'm going to go with Arizona, Chicago, Atlanta, Jacksonville, Minnesota, um, Houston, and did I say Atlanta already? Mm-hmm. Yeah. So, um, Arizona has drafted inside linebacker the last two drafts. Yeah. Um, they're they were living Jones. off of Chandler Jones. They have JJ Watt. I don't know, man. 
Um, Buda Baker is a decent player, but I think he's his reputation is higher than his actual production. Um, Chicago's terrible. Atlanta. Um, the problem I have with Atlanta is the names on that defense are not as good as the production. So like mm-hmm. Deion Jones last year was like our 81st ranked linebacker. He was like a below replacement player. Um, you know, so I'm not the biggest fan of, of you know, and he might be gone. Even. Um, they lose Foye Luacon, uh, Grant, uh, you know, their nickel corner that they drafted around two, I believe last year, uh, sort of unproven. And Jared hasn't, the Jared's had an amazing career, but he's on the down. So. Um, Minnesota, the, the, the interesting thing with Minnesota is, I think, I don't, I don't know if Zadarius Smith is going to be like Zadarius Smith is their biggest acquisition. And he's mm-hmm. a guy that played like one game last year. And he's already sat out a ton of spring practices with a back injury. And I just don't know if like, if you're a big guy that's trying to rush from all over the defensive line, that whether or not you can be counted on if you are a back injury guy, mm-hmm. um, Danelle Hunter, and, and this is going to ruffle some feathers, but like Danelle Hunter doesn't get off the ball very fast. I mean, I, you know, when you look at the NGS data and stuff, Danelle Hunter is a, is a very, very, very good complimentary pass rusher that is always played with somebody like Everson Griffin. And I, I always, when you look at the data, Everson Griffin was always the one that got the double teams. And so they're relying on Zadarius Smith to be that guy. And I, I just don't, I'm not buying into that. Yeah. No. And, and to be clear, um, my tier five and tier six are basically the same tier. And the, Tier six to me was just a team that like, I don't know that there's any player that you get really that excited about, um, at least yet. Uh, So I have tier six, which is like, I am stoked if my offense is playing this defense. Um, I had the Seahawks, the Lions, the Cardinals, the Bears, the Texans, the Jags, and the Jets. I think if you look at this set, and here's where I, you know, I think we disagree a little bit. The Seahawks, I just, no. (laughs) Okay. No, I think they're going to be a sieve. So do you not think that that's the one place where Carroll actually adds value? <sighs> Maybe. I happen to think <laughs> I mean, not, that it's... I mean, not to be... I don't yeah, know. I happen to think that it's more from a kind of cultural perspective, and that's why I had him ranked so low. I just, you know, it seems to me like it's kind of... I don't know. It, it may not be the case anymore. Um, but they're really bereft of talent. I mean, they they really are. And I am, you know, to your point about Drew Locke, they have also been a defense that has had on the other side Russell Wilson. And if you look at now what they have, I mean, that's the biggest fall off. I would be very worried about what this defense will look like when Drew Locke is going three and out every every possession. I do, mean, you do not worry the same thing about the Falcons then? Oh, I absolutely do. I So... AJ Terrell is better than any. Right. Yeah. So there's a talent level disparity at the corner position between. Those yeah. Teams. Exactly. I mean, Artie uh, Burns is slotted to play corner for the Seahawks. I don't know if I, you know, like that doesn't give me a whole. As our, as our former boss would say, Artie Burns. Exactly. So, you know, the the two the two teams here that I do, um, you know, don't think will be good, but could be. Um, you know, if I had to pick from this group, the Jets obviously are ones that stick out. And I, I think I had a hard time putting the Jets in this um, in this tier because I, I really like a lot of the players on their team. But it's just it kind of remains to be seen if they can kind of all put it together with yeah. with Robert Salah. I mean, I love Sauce Gardner, but who knows yet? Um, you know, I, I, I think that's something that remains to be seen. So for now, they stay in this tier, uh, but they could. They could certainly move up, but this is this is the tier where it's like, yep, fire up the offense. Time to set some records. Okay, I hope that this is my last tier, and I hope it leads into our one of our segments, which is called adding to the Lions Den. <laughs> um, these are teams that were bad in 2021 but could improve, and I have Washington, the New York Football Jets, and the Detroit Lions. Um, I think with Detroit, it's clear like what you're doing here. You're putting two top three picks at premium positions in Akuda and Aiden Hutchinson. You also get Kirby Joseph, who is a good player in Illinois. Um, you, you have some, you have a chance there. I, I'm not saying they're going to be good, um, but they could improve. Washington has a great group up front. 
And I think honestly, a lot of last year was really bad variance associated with two expectations were too high. The defense faltered, but you know, you have William Jackson, you have Kendall Fuller, you have that entire front front seven of first round picks. Um, You're really low on the football team. Wow. I, I, I mean, they were terrible last year. They were horrendous yeah. as a defense. Yeah, but and, but defenses, that's the thing. Is yeah, it's they were 26th in yards per play allowed. They were better, actually, in EPA. Um, no, there weren't. They were worse. Like, they were bad. Um, but I think they'll improve. Like, I, I think they'll improve. Um, I think the rest of the teams in the NFC East, though, have better offenses than – um, than were were they were last year right so so that's going to be a little bit of a challenge um and then you know i think with the jets like you know they don't have really have a weakness on defense but you know gardner is going to be probably their star and you know at baking on a cornerback being your star on defense is like not necessarily a great bet um Mm -hmm. but they will improve and i think salah you know the the improvements he had in san francisco were so good from one year to the next that when you know when it, and this happens with the defense it's fleeting but when it happens it's sort of like snowballs and and you end up with a a great defense you can win with and maybe the maybe the jets have that this year no that's fair um before we get to the lion's den reminder that you can go to pff.com right now and get yourself a pff subscription for 25 percent off the promo code forecast f-o-r-e C-A-S-T, get an edge subscription, unlocks all of PFS premium written content, plus fantasy rankings and other fantasy tools. You're going to want those very, very soon. They're getting a little bit of a facelift too, which I think you'll be excited about. And when you get an elite subscription, you get access to everything that PFF has, including what Eric and I use on a daily basis, our player props tool, our best bets tool, and our betting dashboard. So go... Get your year-long subscription now so that you're covered for the rest of the season and take advantage of 25% off with promo code FORECAST, F-O-R-E-C-A-S-T. All right. It is yeah, your time. Is, it is, is time called to... adding to the lion's den. Okay. And we and look, sometime, and we could be wrong about the lions. Don't get me wrong. I'm writing an article this week um, on what I like about their their bet, you know, their, their uh, futures market and stuff like that. So uh, look out for that on pff.com. Right now on pff.com, the the main article right now is some player props for rookies that I like that we talked about in the show. Um, you know, go ahead and, and check that out. But our friend, um, and I know she listens to the show a little bit, uh, but we've both been on her show. Uh, fantastic. Uh, Lindsay Rhodes, uh, who, uh, Sirius XM satellite radio. Um, she was talking with her uh, co-host, uh, Michael Fabiano, as well as Benjamin Raven. Um, and, and she said, Quote, I went through the entire line schedule, and I swear, you guys, there are nine wins there for them that are <laughs> extremely possible. Consider me smashing the over on six wins and also buying Honolulu Boost Flag. I'm in. Look, the, the thing I like about the Lions Den that we've created here is we're not going to be one of those people who are like, you know, I like this band before everybody else. Mm-hmm. Huh. Huh. Back the Honolulu Blue. As, as the slogan would be. Um, come, come. By the way, uh, if you want an off-market price, uh, and before I print it out uh, on, uh, and I you know, bet this already, but Caesars, if you are in a, a place that has Caesars, they are plus 475 to make the playoffs. If you look at, if you look at, sorry, FanDuel, it's plus 370. If you look at betonline.ag, it's plus 325. And if you look at DraftKings, it's four to one. So the, the disparity, like if you're getting 75 cents more than the next best line, the next best legal line, like go you know, shop around because that's a really good place to go. We are all Caesars. Those, those commercials. By the way, we yeah, should do amazing. a – the it's next amazing. thing that we should rank uh, is sports books. And we should rank them on a combination of like how good is the sports book to actually use and then also their marketing. Because all these sports books are spending billions of dollars on marketing. Actually, I don't know if it's quite billions, but you know, close to a billion dollars on marketing, which is a lot. Mm-hmm. And um, and uh, some of them leave something to be desired. So I think that would be a fun uh, a fun episode. I have some I have some strong opinions there. Yeah, uh, here- I wonder. I wonder if we would be the best. Maybe we should get a guest to do that because I do think that that would be. Um, you know, because we, we don't live in elite, like I, I bet, you know, 
mostly offshore and mostly um, PPHs right. and stuff. But then I will, you know, obviously dabble when I go to the state of Indiana, which I'm going to today on my way to Wisconsin. Um, but, you know, there are and, and there was actually if, if any of you follow Gil Alexander, who is of decent fame, um, he has a very good uh, video up right now on his um, on his Twitter where he's talking to an odds maker slash better who is also a host on the show on one of the shows on DS Beeson, um, where he talks about trying to make uh, player props at a barstool sports book in Colorado and how barstool, you know, was doing some really shady things. I, and, and so it's good to sort of read up on that because it's, it's not necessarily, I mean, getting your money out of these sports books and stuff like that are, it is a, is, is a very non-trivial thing. Um, our friends, you know, Scott Jones, a guy who listens to the show, really good friend of mine. Uh, he can tell you an ordeal about my bookie. Um, it, th- so the sports betting thing is extremely tricky as far as getting money, and get, getting money in and getting money out with Bitcoin. It made it a lot easier, but now the value of Bitcoin is like, you know, uh, it has fallen substantially. So, um, those are all things to, to really think about. Um, but yeah, that'd be a great show for us. Can I, can I finish with my, with my hot take of the week? Please. Okay. He's 13th and a half, uh, average draft position on our friends at underdog fantasy. So I, I think the sharp people are here already, but I don't think the public right now, and he was six last year, PFF war. He ran a four, four, three on the field, um, it, you know, per our NGS receiver stuff. I think C.D. Lamb of the Dallas Cowboys is going to absolutely fillet the league this year. Really? Yes. And I, I just been watching C.D. Lamb tape like last night after I got done with everything uh, for work, and I went through. I even went through Matt Harmon's reception perception data on his open stuff. I, I you know, he's a 90th percentile guy and getting open against single coverage touchdown. Uh, Philadelphia Stars and that over hits. Um, I, I think C.D. Lamb, like without Cooper there, everybody pigeonholed him as just a slot guy in his in as a rookie. He played a lot, mo- majority of the snaps outside last year. Yep. One point nine ish yards per route run, despite having to share targets with Michael Gallup and you know Cedric Wilson and uh, Almari Cooper and you know Dalton Schultz. Um. It's the year for CeeDee Lamb. And and again, like I think the sharp people, like, look, the fact is, is he's like really been, he's been taken really high in, in underdog. So, you know, the smart people are on it. Um, I even, th- I would even go higher than that for him. Like, I, I think, I think, I think he's going to absolutely roast this league this year. I'm a fan of that um, because uh, I, I have uh, CeeDee Lamb shares in my league, I, uh, my leagues. I, I am interested. You know, I think there's a it, he's a great in my opinion speculative bet where you know, is there a chance that um you know, that with all the attention on him because here's the fact, the fact of the matter is Mari Cooper is one of the best route runners in the NFL. I mean, mm-hmm. he toasts people. So, you put one corner on Amari Cooper, you might as well kiss a goodbye. So, I will be interested to see how that looks when he's got you know, all of the attention on him. I'm also, Eric, interested in, I think he and and Dak had a really good connection last year. Yeah. But, you know, Dak and Amari have been, you know, I, Amari was still his guy. And so I do think there, that it's interesting. However, if it clicks, I think that's, you know, you have a potential for, I don't want to say that, you know, he could have a Cooper Cup-esque season, but that's an offense. That's that where been, I'm going with this. Like, I think like, it's going... I think that's that's in the range of outcomes, right? If you think about, I'm not sure there is, I, I'm with you on this, in that I'm not sure there is a receiver that if you pick him at that position could legitimately win you your league, a la the way Cooper Cup did last year, like to the level that CeeDee Lamb could. Yeah, and look, like Lamb did not have a 100-yard receiving game after Dak came back from injury. So he had six for 112 in the Cooper Rush game. Uh, or, you know, this, the NBC game, um, the Denver game where Denver blew out, you know, when, when Dak came back, he only had, the, he had 94 yards against Atlanta in that real, and he had two touchdowns in that game. He did not have a touchdown the rest of the season. So, 
you know, 14 yards against KC, 89 yards against New Orleans, which he looked pretty good. Washington, 61. Um, and then, you know, in the playoff game against the Niners, just 21 yards on four, ca- on, on four targets. So it's very much looking at, like, how did he finish? Why did he finish that way? And I think my, my thesis is you just didn't, like, Tack was not playing good football at the end of the season, mm-hmm. right? And, like, he's a streaky guy. And, again, this is, like, the, the Cooper Cup, um, you know, uh, the Cooper Cup, I guess, uh, rationale is like who's Cooper Cup's quarterback? It's Matthew Stafford. Who are the only two quarterbacks that I put in the Matthew Stafford tier? It's Dak and Matthew Stafford. Where mm-hmm. if Dak is like if Dak plays out of his freaking mind for a whole year, who's going to be the recipient of it? In my opinion, the, my money is on Ceedee Lamb. I think Ceedee Lamb is going to be amazing this year. And um, and again, like I I, I just think it's going to be it's going to be one of those things where yeah, I think some of the, a lot of the sharp people are on it right now, but um. But I, I'm gonna, I'm gonna back. I'm gonna go with them. And, and as soon as these props are released on some of these major markets, I'm gonna bet uh, over pretty heavily. There you have it. Um, that is our show. We will be back on Wednesday again, remotely, but still uh, giving you the best we possibly can. Thank you to all the syndicate members for hanging out with us. We love you all. We'll see you next week.